Good morning, morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are tuning in from or if you are catching us on replay. This is The Awesome Journey. I am your host, Kelly Steinica, along with my co-host in care, who is finally back from her three-week trip in Asia, Christy Howard. And uh, we are two girls that just met on, connected on LinkedIn 15 years ago, live on opposite sides of the country and I may have prayed about living louder in my purpose. And now here we are with microphones, um, bringing you the awesome journey. And for those of you that are new here, and just as a reminder, one of our primary goals was to highlight incredible individuals to share their unique stories and challenges, because let's be honest, we are all united in our personal journeys. And one of the other reasons that we brought this and brought it to LinkedIn was because not only were we struggling with job searching, but seeing so many other people struggle and knowing that the job market has changed dramatically, there's been so many layoffs and we wanted to do as much as we could to help as many people as possible. So one of the other things we wanted to do is bring recruiters like Ed Hahn, who we have with us today, to highlight and to give as much information to job seekers, allow you to ask questions um, and just bring you up to date on what's happening because the market has changed. And especially for those of you who have been laid off for the first time, maybe in your career, um, we're just seeing it. So we're really excited again to have Ed Hahn with us today, who is a talent acquisition geek. And let's be honest, I love anyone that's got geek in their, in their title. Uh, he is also a contributor to uh, jobhunt.org. And we want to spend as much time with him today to get as much insight to help as many of you as possible. So that being said, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host in care, who I have missed over the last three weeks and so grateful to have you back, Miss Christy Howard. Hello, hello, hello. And I'm so glad to be back. Yes, Asia was fantastic. Um, but it was good to be back. And thank you, Kelly, for taking care of my puppy dogs while we were gone. I had a fly away from Arizona. So it was our, now our sixth time that we've ever been around each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited to have Ed on for the fact that what I do, um, and just read my about and recommendations and all that fun stuff, but I'm all about helping the job seeker. Um, we get in our head and this is where people are having a hard time praying and spraying and throwing jello against the wall and just, it, it's very frustrating. It's, it's hard on somebody's mental health, um, financially, um, mentally, spiritually, physically. And, you know, I'm, I, my whole thing is about the helping them, coaching them to, for the confidence, but also directing them to the right people to listen to. And Ed is one, I mean, Ed is, um, hyperactive on LinkedIn, but what's <laughs> great is hyperactivity. Um, we don't need to give him any ADHD pills or anything like that. He gives awesome, awesome information. Um, and with that, go ring his bell, go follow him because it'll be information that, I mean, I'm hearing from people like, well, you know, I hear this thing and I hear that, and I, I don't know what way to go because some people give information yet they're not really even understanding what I'm asking. So Ed, my first question to you mm -hmm. will wait until you tell us about you and how you even became a recruiter. First of all, thanks very much, Kelly and Christy, for having me. <clears throat> um, I was uh, excited to be invited to appear, so thanks very much. Um, so my journey into recruiting is kind of fun. Um, fun in, in like every sense of the word, right? Uh, at least it's easy to say that in retrospect. So, you know, you when you're a kid in high school, right, and you know these people, you've known these people who knew exactly what they wanted to do when they grew up. They had their plan. They had a game plan all mapped out. There was a very clear strategy, right? They worked their tails off and, and got really good grades. <clears throat> you know, maybe it's salutatorian, valedictorian, right? They went off to a to a top shelf school and then you know <clears throat> after graduating maybe they went to advanced education and then into whatever field that they had game planned 15 years ago right that's not me okay <clears throat> i mean i knew when i got to college that i wanted to be an english major no i don't know what my game plan was for after that no one did 
right? <clears throat> and so, uh, so what happens? I spent a bunch of years in a career that, as I like to put it, happened to me. Oh, well, I'm an English major. I guess I should work in publishing now that I've graduated and earned this degree. And so I did that for five years. And then my position was eliminated. And then I had to get, do a little bit of a gut check. Well, what do I want to do now? Well, I've got quite these skills. I can logically make this transition to other stuff. And that's kind of the way that my career unfolded. Um, and in the old days, we used to call this back office and front office, right? Back office being all the stuff that doesn't interact with the public or, or with clients. And, and front office, the stuff that does. So I'd always been a very much a back office kind of guy. And yet over the years, as I organically charted this meandering path in my career, uh, so, so to, as, such as it was, um, I moved into more of a front office kind of role until ultimately I was doing client relations for uh, for uh, for an apparel firm. And then I don't know how many of you folks remembered a lot of the conversations you had with other people during the financial crisis, during the Great Recession. Um, you know, there was a very common joke dur during that time. Hey, you know what the status symbol is of this time? At this time, having a job. You know, um, it was a status symbol I did not have for for several years, to be honest. And you know, in this time, I got to know a lot about job search. I attended a lot of job search groups, got involved and in, very heavily involved in several of them. You know, um, <clears throat> but over the course of this process, I networked a lot. I networked my rear off, um, and that was hard because when I was young, um, I considered myself very shy and very introverted. You know, um, I, I was I was self-effacing to the point where people would not pay me any mind, which, as I'm sure other guests have said, is not good for your career because it's terrible. Um, but over the course of that time, I, I learned a lot about the job search process. I learned, oh gosh, in the, in the, during the financial crisis, there were a lot of recruiters who were offering help to job seekers, you know? And I got involved in that effort. And then I went networked with a whole lot of recruiters and eventually I started to finally realize, wow, this would be a really interesting profession. I'd really like to do this. And so networking my way through things, um, Ultimately, so uh, a connection I formed during that time led to my first job in recruiting. And then that's what I've now been doing for the last 11 and a half years. Wow. So how, I, oops, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Nope. Nope. I was just going to say, I, I think the initial question uh, for me that came out of that is, you know, turn, transitioning into it 11 years ago after the financial crisis, which God, it feels like it was longer than that ago, but um, <laughs> is what is the difference now? Because I, I feel like the change just in the last three years, six months, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like it's such a dramatic shift. What are your thoughts on that as far as the differentiation between that time and, and now? It's a little difficult for me to answer that question, Kelly. And the challenge for me is I have a very different vantage point on it right now versus th then, right? Um, insofar as I can draw any kind of real lessons or takeaways that would be helpful to, to viewers, I would say that, um, you know, there is still a tremendous number of job seekers and a relatively small number of opportunities for certain skill sets. And I think that's an important distinction to draw because we hear about all of the layoffs that are being conducted at large tech firms. And we've been hearing about it for three quarters now, right? Oh, yeah. um, and yet hiring is actually brisk in certain other sectors. So don't allow yourself to be fooled by a lot of the headlines that you see because the headlines for, tend to, <clears throat> number one, come in bunches, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but number two, they tend to speak to only certain segments, certain parts of the entire universe of employers, right? Uh, so that's a very important distinction, I think, to draw. Um, like tech certainly is hurting very badly right now. 
Other industries are not. And that is absolutely being borne out if you look at some of the studies that are going on out there. Um, I recently saw a study that says there's currently still 1.9 opportunities for every job seeker. I think it was just yesterday or, or, or today, as a matter of fact. However, I'm going to interject. With these opportunities, I'm going to pivot here, people are applying and they're applying and they're dropping, going through hoops and they're not either getting ghosted or they're getting rejection letters that say, we've gotten too many applications. We're not even going to see, we're not even going to review your resume. Um, and what's happened, you know, so there's a lot of people who have transferable skills and they're like, well, I don't know what industry I should be into because of tech being where it's at. Can I go into healthcare? Can I go? Mm-hmm. So my question at the beginning was as a tech recruiter, mm-hmm. because you see a lot of TAs out here. You guys are very vocal, which is great. Um, where would a C-suite in sales, where would an executive assistant, what kind of, where would they find that recruiter that's not per se just for an industry? The recruiter that looks for a um, ocup- the occupation. So that, that's actually a little bit tricky and ticklish of a question, Christy. Well, I don't like to be tickled, so. Well, that's fair. Um, <laughs> the, the, the challenging thing is that recruiters are, recruiters will, are defined very often by the places we have been recruiting, right? Um, if I say to most people that I'm a technical recruiter, they understand that that means I chiefly recruit for technology skill sets, not that I'm a big tech recruiter, which I am not, to be clear. Um, you know, there's there's certain very particular specialties in, re- in recruiting as a profession. Uh, there's high volume recruiting, uh, which tends to focus on entry level type of positions. Um, and that's a very different animal. I've done it. It is not my favorite style of type of recruiting to do because uh, that's just not my aptitude. It's, it's really not. And you know, people tend to gravitate towards the things where they do have deeper aptitude, right? Yeah. Um, there's executive recruiting, which I've done a fair bit of now in the last couple of years, um, which is fun. It's exciting. And, and, but it does take a certain additional level of effort right? Because you're talking about some very experienced people and there's often a lot of contention for their interest. So you have to offer a different level of um, support and immediacy if they have a question. Um, Technical recruiting, uh, you know, I think we all understand that that is just understanding what the skill sets are that we're talking about. So that's a different animal. and so oftentimes beyond that, recruiters will be broken out into, say, particular industries, right? right? Um, but certain functions, certain core functions are irrespective of industry, right? Your C-suite, for example, that very often can transcend industry. And there's exceptions, right? Like your very highly regulated industries, you typically don't want someone coming into it that doesn't have that kind of background. Right. right. I mean, the next CEO, J&J, for example, that person needs to be a pharma veteran. They need to understand that regulatory environment because otherwise there's going to be some real problems. Right. Right. Financial services, same deal. Uh, but when you start moving away from that level of regulation, then it's a lot more transferable. And, you know, we, we saw a lot of this during the during during the teen teen years, I think. Right. A lot of very senior uh CEOs coming into an industry that where they didn't have direct experience, right? But they had broad experience. And it was a question of just being able to be a capable leader and cheerleader for the organization and cheerleader for the shareholders. Right. right. So my other question, because you know I'm all about questions for my jobs. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with ageism? 
So there's a couple yeah. of ways to address the topic of ageism, right? There's a couple of things that can look like ageism, but, but may not necessarily be. Um, and yeah, there's this is absolutely a thing that happens. I've actually seen it happen uh, in conversations with clients back in the days when I used to be an external recruiter and, uh, and other forms of bias that are, of course, contemptible. Um, but there's, a, but here, I will say this, job seeker, listen, we all know this is the thing that happens. Then there's a lot of things that can look like it, but at the end of the day, these are people who are going to see you, see what you look like, hear your voice and the way you speak. And they're going to make certain judgments based upon that input over which you have no control. Yeah. And if they're going to form a negative opinion based on these factors, they do not deserve your talent, period. Yeah. And I agree, I agree, but it, it's yeah. very hard it now is. because, and, and my, you know, getting on my soapbox, those people who have those judgments and biases tend to forget that they're going to get old too. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I feel like, I mean, and th this is one of those topics that I think, you know, some people will be like, oh, ageism does not exist. And it's like, yes, it does. Um, and, and it is kind of a, you know, a tender topic because it does happen. And I agree with you, Ed, 100%. If, if you're going to be judged, yes, my, your opinion of me is none of my business. However, when you're someone who's been out of the job market and looking because I need to pay my bills, right. those kind of things really kind of deepen the the mental and emotional impact. Sure. And it's like, how do I get around those things? Because I, I hear from people also who are saying, you know, like, I can't even get a job at, you know, a, at a local retail store. Right. Um, and so it, it's this kind of slippery slope in the sense of, I'm on it. I don't know how to get off and how it impacts them emotionally, mm -hmm. but how do I get around it? I know that so, it's difficult to get around on some ways, but there are some tips that you sure. can follow, correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the go-to tips are typically number one, don't include things like when you graduated from your last high, higher highest education, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a no brainer. Um, although if you did uh, grad school, that you can leave right. on because that's not that's not intrinsically tied to an age, right. right? Right. High school or college graduation years absolutely pegged to age, right? We all know uh, that you're typically 22 or so when you exit undergraduate. Um, so don't get ruled out for that. That's silly. Um, don't include resume. Don't include experience as more than 15 years old tops unless it's very directly relevant to the position you're targeting in which case you find another way to present it that's outside of that context of how long ago it was and the reason is twofold because number one when you start talking about more than 15 years experience it's kind of not difficult to guess oh this person has been around the block for a while and that's only natural to guess how long a while especially based on the seniority of the positions that are included in the work history right no no one starts off their careers as a program manager right right unless you're doing um, or, or that. <laughs> <laughs> but, this, is where, this is where i'm i agree with you when i do help with resumes you know we do the additional experience because right. i had an additional experience that i had that right. always when i was in the ea for a c-suite however my right. linkedin this is where and this is another question for a recruiter obviously mm -hmm. Um, my LinkedIn, I look at, we're a business, they're a business, we're B2B, mm -hmm. you know, they need my business, let's see if I need their business. I have all the way down to a position I did in my 20s, okay. because it's just my management. Well, they're going to look at that and go, well, let's put this together. She's in her 60s. But, you know, I never said on my resume how many years of experience. Right I mean, now, I scream it. You know, forty plus years. But it, it's it's tough because when you do have that experience when you're younger, to be able to that you have to dumb down. I guess when I look at somebody's LinkedIn, I'm like, this mm -hmm. is your marketing page. You shouldn't mm -hmm. have to dumb down. It. Well, so where do you where do you fall on that? Because. Yeah. 
you know, well, I see their personality. So to me, as a recruiter, what I care about is what is relevant to the job you're seeking, right? Like I began my career working in publishing. That is utterly immaterial vis-a-vis -vis what I might be doing in the future at this point forward, right? And I spent five years in that industry. I understand it. I'm also not. I'm also glad not to be in it any longer because uh, I, I don't think it's got a whole lot of a future, frankly. Um, that's neither here nor there, though. Um, but I don't include it because it's not relevant. Now, if, for example, you're talking about someone who was, for example, um, a veteran their entire career of a particular industry, mm. that might be advantageous, you know, to, to demonstrate, especially if it's a highly regulated industry such as pharma is. Yeah. Uh, and that's because it's important sometimes in certain kinds of roles to demonstrate you have witnessed the evolution of the regulatory environment, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like if, if you're talking about a role that is about compliance with regulation, that that specific context could be really valuable. And I'm not gonna try to tell you that there's one right way to handle this. There is not, you know, I mean, job searches and the hiring process are so complex with so many moving pieces. I don't think it's possible to say that there is, there is this one law and you must all do this. I mean, right. I think that's, it would be the height of arrogance for anyone to make that statement. Yeah. I'm gonna pull in some of this chat so I can- okay. You because yeah. we Paul uh, asked a question, and I'm going to I'll share my my insight on it since I deal okay. with job seekers. But anyway, we've got Daryl, we've got Omar, uh, oh. Jeff Witherspoon, who's a job Brent, uh, job seeker, Brendan Gilbert, yes. Don. Yeah. Thank you, Don, for always supporting us. Yes. Uh, hey, Brendan. Um, I'd, I'd share everything. I'd be clicking it over back and forth, but it's not going to happen. Anyway, uh, here's the question. Mm -hmm. So Paul wanted to know about having job seekers do live video standouts. And he, mm -hmm. you know, he, he defers to your expertise. Now, as somebody who helps job seekers and not mm -hmm. understanding their mental state um, and knowing that looking for a job is a full-time job, and I know that's doing a live myself once a week. It takes a lot of time. And a lot of the, a lot of people, they don't have that time or the ability to just say, I'm going to jump on a live. I mean, we have some job seekers that we're like begging. I mean, begging to get on mm -hmm. here because they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. Right. However, I'm going to flip it over. Th that's my opinion is why you're not. I add a little bit before we go to Ed for this too, right. because okay. my other, I, I'm, I'm too excited about this too. In the sense of, I always love somebody that tries something new. I've interviewed hundreds of people over my career. And I mean, when somebody has something unique and different, you, they, they stand out. However, I think this, this whole thing of like, you should be on LinkedIn live, you know, eight hours a day, pitching yourself to everyone I mean, in theory, that kind of sounds like an okay idea, maybe. But the other side of me is like, but recruiters and or employers aren't coming to LinkedIn to see who's doing a LinkedIn Live of their resume. So it's kind of like, I don't know that that's really the right approach. I think having maybe a video in your featured uh, section on your on your profile may be a great idea. But the actual live thing, because like I said, I, recruiters aren't going, I'm going to LinkedIn because I want to see who's doing a live today on, on pitching themselves for a job. So I am curious of, of what your thoughts are and how people, you know, what are ways that people can stand out a little bit from the crowd? Because I think everybody is just sort of feeling like I'm doing what everyone else does, but it's doing nothing. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sympathetic, right? Because... I spent two and over two years not having a proper job during the financial crisis. So please, please, it's not that I'm unsympathetic, that I don't know what or remember still how much it hurts some mornings. Right. Okay? It's a Monday morning. You still don't have a job. And, you know, if you feel like the rest of the universe is getting up, doing their morning routine, getting ready for work, blah, blah. And, yeah, that, that takes a toll week in, week out, month in, month out. I get that. All right. So here's what I'm going to say. When people 
go into tech, create a tech startup, right? Their dream is always that they want to be the next Bill Gates and the next Mark Zuckerberg, the next Sergey Brin, right? They all want to be wildly successful. We all know these names because they are now legendary. <laughs> you know what names we don't know? The relatively tens of thousands of people who were not successful right there is a certain amount of survivorship bias bias that happens in these things that we see that stand out to us they stand out specifically because they are the exception not the norm right now as a recruiter i mean kelly what you said exactly that on i i don't go to linkedin in order to go check out what job seekers vid or videos are, are happening i mean i have got time for that right. frankly you know, when I'm looking at a profile, I usually size it up in definitely less than a minute. Yes or no, do I want to look at this person for the position? You know, maybe if I am a little more present and not rushed, I will look at it and say, oh, not right for this, but definitely want to talk with them about something else for down the road and then come back to them, you know, make that note. But I can't always do that, frankly, because I'm sometimes rushed, you know. Uh, and that's the thing that happens. Um, so here's the other thing. In a hiring process, I don't think it's a good practice to reward video in a meaningful way. And the reason I say that is because the people who are good at doing videos are neurotypical, tend to be extroverted, and are very expressive. Does this define the entirety of the highly skilled and capable workforce? No, mm -hmm. no, it does not. Those of you watching this right now, you think to yourself, do I know more people who would be great at that or more people who'd be kind of meh at that? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, which is a great point. And that was my other thing is like, it's not that people don't wanna to try to do something different. This isn't for everybody. And not everybody translates the same way. So it could be, I mean, and then that's kind of a sad thing. I don't want to tell everybody, go do video, because that's what's going to be the answer, because it's not, because it's definitely not, whoops, um, <laughs> is it's not going to be the same for everyone. You know, we, we all definitely don't translate the same. And just because uh, somebody is maybe a little bit more introverted and they don't have a video doesn't mean they won't be great for the position that is right. being looked at. Um I just think it's it's an option for people to use. And like Christy and I, the reason we wanted to do this was like, how can we pay it forward bigger and louder to to give it to more people? Um, but this isn't for everybody. And we know that. And that's right. why we wanted, you know, people are sitting on the sidelines or on the fray, however you want to say it, and not knowing what to ask or feeling like they're alone. And we thought if we can just get more um, information out to more people, that it will help more people because they don't even know what to ask a lot of times, you know, I right. think, and that's a bigger issue with some of those folks who have been laid off for the first time, maybe in 10, 15, 20 years. And they're coming to LinkedIn that has changed dramatically and being like, I don't even know where I'm supposed to start here. <laughs> right. And yet there's a lot of that. I mean, especially if you haven't had to conduct a search in a long time. Yeah. Um, the game has changed so much. You know, I mean, the, the fact that it's and unfortunately it's become a game. Well, I think, I, on some level, it's always been a little bit of a game, but I think right. it's become more pronounced. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like, kind of want to go back to what you were saying before a little bit, Ed, and, and maybe if you can uh, pinpoint this in any way, when you were saying when you go look at a, a, a profile, mm -hmm. what is it about it? Even if you're if you're rushed and you're going through. What makes someone's profile stand out to you and get your attention as a recruiter? Two things, and exactly two things. Take notes, people. <laughs> <clears throat> One, when I am searching, I am searching for keywords. If I'm looking for a project manager, I want to know, did you do, for, are you a project manager? Have okay. you done many projects? Have you delivered them successfully? Do you keep timelines, budgets? So, you know, stuff like that. I mean, this is these are the core competencies of anyone who does project management. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to ask what kind of, you know, um, soft skills you have, because if you can't fundamentally do the job, 
I don't care. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that that is the first fundamental thing that every single recruiter is going to tell you that we search on specific keywords like in some places they they want that pmp certification for project managers mm -hmm. okay guess what that tremendously narrows the scope of the total universe of pms i'm going to be looking at very yeah. simple right um and and in that respect certs in a job description are extremely valuable to recruiters because it allows us to be extremely efficient you know, but you're getting those searches out of the skill sets, right? Or I'm getting them the descriptions or out of the about or where are you getting from it your back end? Where are you grabbing those words from? Anywhere. It could be anywhere on the profile, Christy. Okay. And that's a really great question to ask. Um, now, search results on LinkedIn normally prioritize first the headline field, then the about section, and then the experience sections. But honestly, you really need to be aware, I think, that I it will grab from anywhere on your profile, okay? okay? Like, for example, if, you, if I try to look for people who are in the New York metropolitan area, right, I can just search for New York, but guess what? That's going to pull all the people who've ever worked for New York Life. That's going to pull all the people who have ever... Right. And it's goofy stuff like that. Or people who've worked in New York or the New York area, not necessarily physically located in New York. So there's a lot of art and science behind how recruiters go about searching for people. Because the other thing that no one tells you is that recruiters know that sometimes your profile isn't exactly fully fleshed out. And therefore, the details I might be looking for might not be there, which is a shame an absolute shame because hey mark nice nice to see you in the comments there hey, um it is absolutely critical if you really want us to find you that you actually deploy these keywords wherever you can now it doesn't really matter if you do it the once or many times frankly uh if, it ha if there's one instance there might as well be 50. Ooh. So, okay, so I'm about to show another question that's really sure. interesting. But regarding the search words, so when they have a job and mm -hmm. you're seeing consistent, uh, you know, let's say project manager, and you're seeing certain words that keep mm -hmm. on popping up on these same jobs, is it smart to pull it into your skills? You have it. It's not really on your resume. I mean, you, you've got it in your resume, but it's how do you pop it more? into your LinkedIn to pull it in for the recruiter to grab it. Am I making any sense or am I babbling? Yeah. How do you make it easier to be found is yeah. basically the question. Yeah. Okay. So the short answer to that question is, listen, don't stress about this. Seriously, don't. Um, like I said, if there's one instance, that's all that I really need to go on. All right. Just make sure you spell it properly because because <laughs> here no funny thing Sorry. if you do a search on linkedin for project manager right you will find i think it's 11 million something results i literally did this this morning if you do a search however on project manger you still get uh -huh. one almost two million results <laughs> what? yeah yeah oh forget that a yeah so, here's a question it's i somebody must be um, how do you feel about the recruiters that share fake jobs for pipelining? And I know, you know, salespeople do it all the time. Oh, it's in my pipeline. It's in my pipeline. And I'm seeing there's a lot of fake jobs out there that, you know, I've got, I've got this job. So how do people, <laughs> exactly. It's how do people figure out, is this a fake job or is this just a job yeah. that people are hanging out? I mean, because it's wasting their time. It's wasting mm -hmm. their mental health. I mean, hurting yeah. their mental health. So how do, you know, it's like they're trying to dig the um, needle out of the haystack these days. Yeah. It's hard. You're right. And the fact of the matter is, number one, I think it's a ridiculous practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's ultimately oh. self-defeating, you know. Not every employer does this, to be clear. Um, 
and so the thing is it's going to be almost impossible for a job seeker to discern is this an actual job that they're really hiring for are they just seeing what's out there right now right um there's literally no way for the job seeker to have any meaningful insight so here's the thing right every career coach out there will tell you that listen if you want to pursue the job then actually really pursue it do the little bit of the heavy lifting right put that resume together submit it keep track of it and then keep going every single career coach says this and it is very good advice the problem is that what if you work in a profession where you have a lot of opportunities that you want to pursue right i mean this is simply not sustainable mm -hmm. and by the way if this describes you hey this is a great great situation to be in having a, an abundance of possible options that's fantastic mm -hmm. so look every career coach that i know is going to yell at me for this every single <laughs> one of them I love it. and you know what I don't I, I think in this specific instance it still makes sense. Don't kill yourself customizing it every single time because oh. you don't know. Exactly. You don't. In this very specific instance, I think that's ultimately just a path to insanity. Hmm. I could see that. And it isn't that the whole point of a cover letter is to help customize yeah, to that. A lot of a lot of people don't ask for cover letters and a lot of people don't read they them. Don't. I mean, and what I've shared with my, with, I do cut the consultations and whatever, build your resume. That yeah. when you see, you just build it. You don't need to change it for every job because it's right. the yeah. job that you're looking for. You're building it. It's just, yeah. And, and you can tweak it, but you, your experience is going to be your experience, but you can build onto what they're asking for. And you can say, oh yeah, I do. I did that. So let's change the words a little bit if you need to. Yeah. Sure. And I, so, I think another question, at least that comes to my mind, and I know a lot of people have asked this, you know, ageism was definitely one of them. And this sure. is one that I, I've experienced because I, I was laid off for the first time in my career in 2020 as most marketing mm -hmm. executives, you know, first to go. <laughs> that was a treat. Um, but I couldn't get hired to save my life. And that was during a time, though, where nobody was rehiring C-suite specifically right. in marketing. It kept getting pushed off, pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. And then as I was applying for lower level positions, meaning, you know, more VP marketing or director, mm -hmm. whatever it was, I was getting the whole, you're overqualified. Mm -hmm. And I felt very much at that time, because I was like, I just want a job. And but I right. understood because I've interviewed hundreds of people in my career and being like, this is just a period of time. You want this position because you need a job, but you're going to leave as soon as the market comes back. And I think a lot of people have definitely struggled with that whole overqualified. Is that encapsulating the ageism portion of it? Or how do you really address that when I've had higher positions, but I want to, I want to come in lower somewhere else because that's what right. I want to do now going forward. How do you recommend somebody do that? So I think that a lot of this can be addressed in the way you frame and present your experience, okay? So every resume out there has a summary section that, that positions the person as, I am this level of seniority kind of professional, right? Right there, that's your opportunity. You present yourself as a senior leader of X, right? without speaking to being C-suite necessarily or an officer capable of signing on behalf of the employer, you simply talk about being a senior leader of whatever the cr critical job function is, who is now looking to achieve better work-life balance than, than top seniority. And I think, especially because of the pandemic, especially because there is so much, had been so much conversation about mindfulness and, and achieving balance because people were burning out so, for, so early on in the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Those, because those who were working were burning out very badly, especially in the first responders, but 
certainly other job functions as well. And I think there's a much better awareness that this is a legitimate thing that people are concerned about, right? You would hope. Well, yeah. I think that there is. Uh, I think that there's obviously pockets of resistance here or there, just as there always are when when you see a transformation of this kind. Right. Um, and I, you know, you're you're exactly right, of course, Christy. I mean, this is this is not universal yet, but I am very much hoping that we continue to see this this growing realization become universal. So here's here's a scenario. Okay. There's a there's a uh, he. CEO, president mm -hmm. of sales. Person wants to go down, it's like, you know, life, work, life balance now. I just mm -hmm. want to get back on the ground, do a team. I don't want to deal with the C suite. I want to mm -hmm. go to sell in front of the people. Sure. Can't get it, you know, has the ageism. You're overqualified. Mm -hmm. You're going to be bored. Um, if, and then in interviews, I just wanted to pick your brain because. If I hired you, which I'm not going to, you'd have my job in six months. So mm -hmm. there is there is so much not right about that so the situation yeah. you just described, Christy. <laughs> um, what has happened over? Oh no, I'm I'm not saying it doesn't. Right. I mean, why, and it goes back to sorry. I'm going to go into this one. It goes back to what Paul said. Wouldn't companies want someone who's above what they're looking for? You'd you think that. Pay. You'd think that. Right. Here's Common sense would say so. <laughs> yes. But we're talking about the corporate world here. Yeah. How much does common sense enter into it, really? Come on, guys. Not. Um, look, there's a couple of things going on when overqualified is the concern, right? Mm -hmm. it, when you have a weak leader, there's, a, there's insecurity about being replaced by the new hire, right? And so, look, if it's a weak leader, you don't want to work for that schmuck anyway. I understand that, but when but, you want to, but let's let's. I need a paycheck. On. I want to work for that schmuck, maybe, right? I mean, that, well, that's what some people are going there's a, through. There's right now. always so there's always a, there's always other options, right? It's never no. just that one opportunity. I think we all understand that. Uh, the other so, thing, though, right, is that when the other thing that's that's a problem is, you know. Yeah, it's it's just so contemptible when they don't even when they when they don't even have the facade of an actual interview, right? They they they're they're, they're not even going to go through the motions. They're just going to say, "I want to pick your brains," right? And so and why, then, bother, why bother even have the conversation? Why bother wasting people's time? Because it's arrogant and disrespectful, and they can. Yeah, and they need yeah. to have it in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that that's never going to be a pipeline, right? I mean, you know, if you treat someone with the utmost respect, then yeah, okay, I'm fine. Maybe they'll be open to considering it. But if you really present this as, look, I just want to pick your brain because, you know, I can't hire you because you threaten me, right? I mean, would you ever want to work for that employer no. ever? No. Right. No, absolutely not. <laughs> but they've wasted the person's time to drive sure. that that they're unemployed to have that hour or so conversation mm -hmm. when they're unemployed. So, <laughs> and it's just frustrating because I hear these stories. I mean, and it's yeah. just like, I want to, I want to struggle. You know, Sorry, I'm not trying to, you know, be violent. So I, here's the, thing. <laughs> uh, uh, the problem is that there's a lot of bad hiring practices out there. A yeah. lot of them, right? We all know that there are certain questions that they're not supposed to ask you. It is not <laughs> lawful to ask you. And yet, this still happens every single stinking day. We all know it does. Um, in particular, in particular, it happens to women. And we all yes. know exactly what we're talking about, right? Um, it's just silly. It's, fr it's repulsive that it does. Um, but Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad hiring practices out there. And frankly, you know, as with any time you start talking in sweeping generalizations, there's not great practitioners of any profession sometimes. And sure. unfortunately, people will encounter them. And I'm talking specifically about recruiting, too. I want to be very clear about that. I'm not holding my profession in any way exempt from this. 
Yeah. Some recruiters just suck too. Amen. <laughs> True story. <laughs> yeah. how, how does a job seeker um, bring up, you oh. know, about the, because I know legally they, these big companies have to put out um, a job externally, even though they already have an internal candidate yep. ready, you know, me. Again, you're wasting people's time. Yep. This is, so there's nothing, you, you can't do anything, right? It's, you can't. It's, it's a, there is literally nothing that can be done about it, right? However, however, the thing to keep in mind is that People aren't necessarily hired by the at the first position they apply for. They may be hired for a subsequent one. True, and I've had right? a few. I've so, had many people go through that. And I, I think it's important to understand that it is critical for job seekers to have a target list of employers that are particularly interesting to them, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, there's one fellow who has just bonkers, bonkers, great qualifications, and I really wanted him for this position we had last year. And we could never get the situation right to make sense. You know, uh, we couldn't get the right seniority. Then we can get the right budgeting, and then a bunch of other factors just didn't make sense, right? And look, what I never want as a recruiter is to present someone with an opportunity that they're like, "Well, this will do for now, but six yeah. months, I'm I'm done, I'm gone," right? Yeah. I I don't want that. Not because not just because I'm lazy, although truthfully a little lazy. I don't want to have to do it again. Okay. But the other thing is, if I hire you, I want you to be there for a long time. I want you to grow in the organization as a corporate recruiter. I want you to become a, become a hiring manager I'm going to support and hire for. Mm -hmm. This to me is like the ideal situation when someone gets hired on one of my recs, that I am going to have a long-term partnership with this person that hopefully goes on for years. Right. You know, um, so a given position may not necessarily be the right one for that person at that moment in time. It may, however, be, and that initial conversation may be an investment in a future conversation that will pay dividends then. And of course, so, yeah. there's no way of knowing for certain at this time. Okay. So, what's your suggestion? Because recruiters do ghost when they say, hey, it didn't work out, whatever, and you're still very interested in that job. How do you mm -hmm. go about keeping that relationship with that recruiter? You um, don't. You skip the recruiter. Okay. Awesome. Because Ooh. you know what? The person you really want to talk to is a hiring manager, right? Yeah. Oh, so would you suggest um, that once you've, once you've, in, okay, once you interview with the hiring, you know, the HR people or the hiring manager, do right. you suggest, which I always suggest because I've done it, um, you know, to connect on LinkedIn, to connect, continue to have, oh, there you go, yeah. continue to have those conversations, in a sense, bypass your recruiter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're just kind of going to have casual, informal conversations, absolutely do that, right? The, where the recruiter gets needs to be involved is when you start talking about an actual position. That's when the hiring manager should in, could should loop in the recruiter. Say, hey, Ed, I've been talking with so and so for the last six months informally. And I think I finally have an opportunity to bring that person in. And then I will say, oh, yeah, I remember so-and-so. I'm glad that you told me this. I'm happy to talk with that person again because I really enjoyed talking with them half a year ago and really eager to resume the conversation, which is almost verbatim something that actually happened a couple of weeks ago. But wouldn't, would it be cost-effective, but again, sort of unethical, I guess, for the hiring manager to say, okay, well, we don't need the recruiter. We don't need to spend two minutes. Well, we're just going to go directly to them. I mean, well, I'm a corporate recruiter. There's no, okay. there's no, there's no okay. value add there. Right. Okay. okay. Um, and I will tell you this for an external recruiter, any smart and by smart, I mean, they've been around for more than a couple of years by now. Um, any smart external recruiter has an, or, has an agreement in place with the employer that says, yeah. if you hire someone I introduced you to within X amount of time, you mm -hmm. still pay me for that thing. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Uh, it, it's, refer, it's referred to in recruiting circles as candidate ownership. It's very okay. much a thing. Okay. Um, I was that, always curious about that. Yeah. There's always that. An, an MSA that doesn't speak to this is a bad MSA for the, for the agency. 
Typically, candidate ownership extends for six months. In some unusual cases, it might extend longer. Yeah, I was going to say my experience, it's it's been six months. Yeah. Um, and, and, and same, even being on the corporate side of it and having recruiters, I, I've had some great ones over mm -hmm. time. Um, and I always give, you know, my local Staffing Strong in Phoenix shout out because anyone they ever sent right. to me was always someone worthy of interviewing and qualified for the position. Nice. I've worked with other recruiters that they sent me, I would get 50 um, resumes in my inbox and I'd be like, what did I hire you for? Like, I don't have time to read this garbage and you're supposed to do this. So, I mean, there's, there's just different things and it's, it is about finding the right fit for what you're looking for. And I think this is a conversation that we could go on and on. Cause I think we honestly just really so scratched the surface. And, and that's Ed, why we'll be right back if you'd like. <laughs> yes. I would love sure. to have you back. And you have such, just such a, a great, uh, you have such a calming voice too. Like, I I just, you talk all day. No, so, thank you. Because I, I think, think there's so many a lot of calming time right now for people. Yeah. I and, and there are so many people that don't even know what to ask. They're just struggling. Sure. They don't know what to do. And I think what um and I, I've certainly have witnessed this and I know a lot of other people are, is I can ask uh the same question to eight recruiters and mm -hmm. I can get eight different answers. Yeah. And that's frustrating because it's like, so when I go to LinkedIn to apply for a job, when it says there's been 1,400 applicants, does that really mean impressions? Does that really mean anything? Because I know LinkedIn can't really catch it unless it's an easy apply to know how many because people are turned off. Like there, there's so many layers of things and what Christy and I have been talking about why we wanted to do this because it, it's all on people's mental health because it's all yeah. these, these seeming roadblocks that people don't understand and it's right. it's impacting their their confidence in knowing how to move forward mm -hmm. and they all seem so small individually but when you add them all together it, it's a big deal it is and so here's here's what i would say um look yeah the, the job search is hard there are abs absolutely no question Right. Anyone who says a job search is not hard is lying or has never done one before. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Or has a job and they don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently one they got from like the parent or something like that. Right. Um, the, the, I think the critical thing to understand is that, look, I, I've been saying for over a dozen years now that every question about job search can truthfully and accurately be answered. Well, it depends. Um, but that's also, that's not helpful. So what I'm going to say is this, when someone tell, gives you an answer about job search, ask them why, understand what their framework is in processing the question and the context within, from which their advice arises, right? Because if you talk with a a recruiter who's only ever done external recruiting, they're going to have a different perspective on this entire thing yeah. than if you talk with an HR professional who moved into corporate recruiting has only ever done that, right? Which is still a different perspective than a very senior business leader who has begun a career coaching practice, mm -hmm. right? And this is not to say any one of these voices is intrinsically more or less valuable than the other. But it's that this context is critical in understanding how it impacts what the key factors are that inform what they say and why. So we've got a question. I'm not okay. really sure how to. He wants to know any advice on someone who needs to work from home for health reasons. Because even if you have health reasons or um, you have a handicap and everything. Sure. Right. Accessibility. But I think that can even go deeper, right? Because how many uh, corporations now or just small business, whoever it is, they're not having you in office anymore. They're having you work at home. So I think, I don't know, this is another one of those multifaceted, I think, questions. But but I'm seeing a lot more. I'm seeing a lot more companies want you to work at home or hybrid. I mean, work at the office and hybrid. So the remotes is going away. Yeah. Uh, that's also the trend I see, Christy. Yeah. So mm -hmm. listen. David, that's a really good question. Uh, the challenge for you, 
right, is that number one, your resume and your LinkedIn profile, both, especially if you're saying that you're open to work on LinkedIn, you must absolutely say remote only. Okay. Absolutely mm -hmm. must say this. If you do okay. not, you are harming your search. Where would you put that? In your header, in your about, where would in you put the... settings in the back, isn't it? I think it's one of the options that you choose. Oh, yeah, yes. you, I mean, you have it, but do you have it in the front end, on the front end? Should you have it? No. In the front? Okay. okay. No, but absolutely put on top of the resume. Okay. Because okay. here's the thing. If you live reasonably nearby, like 10 minutes away from the office, I am not going to assume that you still will not come in. Right. Because that is extremely mm. unusual. Right. right. So, for example, let's say uh, you're immunocompromised, right, or you have a mobility issue or any of, you know, countless other possible situations that might describe why you ask the question. OK, so you still are not looking for a remote job. You're looking for a job doing profession that is also remote. And it's mm -hmm. critical to understand that because, look, almost every job, can, oh, the vast majority of jobs can be done remotely. Right. So that's not a meaningful criteria in the way that the question is being presented. I mean, I understand what you want to do, but, you know, that's a very different animal. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you have I mean, I don't deal with visas, um, but I, I wanted to put the question out. Um, so I, Kishore, I can't speak to what the visa visa mm -hmm. and work authorization situation is in the UK, unfortunately. Yeah. I am very familiar with them in the US. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not physically here in the US and also have a sponsor lined up, the right. universe employers who actually can employ you is extremely, extremely small. Yeah. It is so small as to not be something I would consider actually bothering pursuing. It's yeah. that small. So going back to that question about the work, I mean, he's asking. No. Okay. <laughs> do Don't, even. <laughs> Don't even. Don't yeah. even. David, listen, I sympathize. I really do. But especially if you actually happen to physically be located nearby the office, some employers are going to be really pigheaded about this thing. There's mm -hmm. a number of reasons why they will. Some employers, for example, are literally deeply invested in commercial real estate in their physical yeah. location. Uh, with, I can't, Jamie Dimon, think of any <laughs> Jamie Dimon employers that are Jamie Dimon like that, Jamie Dimon. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> you know, um, they, they certainly do exist, to be clear. Um, and for them, this is very much a life death situation. So, yeah, there may be some organizations that are like that might be open to it, but frankly, if they think that you live in the area, they're going to have a little difficulty. Now, with the reason I said put it on the resume, put it on the on the LinkedIn profile in the open to work section, is because that is going to be a criteria when I go looking for talent, because my own organization is specifically hybrid i look for people who are in the physical location <laughs> i am not how but now if i'm not i you better believe i'm looking all over the darn place and then i expect that you go you will want to be fully remote rather than necessarily have to relocate that's where i will find that information yeah so yeah david i would say you would just apply for remote positions that, mm -hmm. that yep that's i'm sorry david uh, and but and also I have a lot of clients like that, that you should just, you know, you're looking for remote. Yeah. Um, yeah. But David, also, please make sure that you're proactively re networking with employers who offer the kind of positions that you have that are on your target list of employers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and be absolutely transparent about the fact that you need to be fully remote. And yeah, yeah at the summary, put it in place of the location on the yeah. on the resume. Really great questions. Thank you. I didn't even know. See, you just taught me something. Love it. <laughs> well, Ed, again, you know. Yes. It's so much it's, to talk about. So much more. We've like yeah. barely scratched yeah. the surface for real. True. <laughs> no. 
Uh, totally. Uh, and... Listen, uh, this has been so much fun. I've, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to be on the show and talk with folks. Thank you very yeah. much for the invitation. And I appreciate it. Yeah. And you all have a fabulous, fabulous Tuesday. Um, and we will see you next week. We actually have a job seeker on next week. She was chiming in a little bit this week uh, on this one. Um, but um, she's been looking for months. And as her comment was, this shouldn't be this hard. I mean, I remember, I'm old school. I remember walking in and just, here's my, here's my application. Hire me. Yeah. Yeah. Show you. I mean, you know, and I worked in many different industries. It's just, you just walked in and they hired you. Um, yeah. So we're trying to get job seekers, get your voice out there. Because when you interview, they want to see you. So let's get everybody to see you and show, you know, what you want to do. You know, as I always say to people, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, um, you might not even know if you still want to do what you want to do. You might have transferable skills and there's recruiters out there like Ed and Mark. They'll say, hey, we're here to help you. Um, and, you know, Kelly and Christy can just pick their brain for you. Yes. So we will definitely be having Ed back. Yeah. I mean, do go, please go to Ed's profile, ring his bell like Christy and mine. Uh, Ed does do tips of the day. He does Ed talk. Um, and he is the recruiter's recruiter. I've seen other recruiters that say he's their go-to for things. So please do follow him. Uh, ask any additional questions. We'll go back into the comments, but we will continue this conversation because we know this isn't a, a one episode uh, thing. This is so multifaceted. Um, so if you do have other things, please DM Christy and I. We're, we're happy to do as much as we can to help as many of you as possible. And again, we thank you for joining us on this awesome journey today. And Ed, we couldn't thank you enough for your time. And Christy, I'm so glad to have you back. And everyone, go out and enjoy the rest of your day because as long as we can help, we want to make this journey as awesome as possible for all of you. We'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>